Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa mawala. Amma ba'd. So today we're gathered here to speak about a very special person. Every second Friday we gather to speak about the personality of the month. And all of us have the calendars. This month's personality is someone very special and someone who's not very well known. And the idea behind these biographies was to highlight individuals from our tradition and our history who are very, very important and who are not very well known. So our personality today is a man, although many of us, many of us may have heard of him, but those of us living in this country some of the younger generations may not be so familiar with that particular person. But he's a person who is very, very important. It was someone about whom, if you remain ignorant about his life, it's to our own detriment. Someone who shaped the Muslim world, especially in the region that most of us are from, the region of India and Pakistan, who shaped the region in very major ways, in profound ways. That particular person, his name is Muhammad Ismail al-Dahlawi, also known as Muhammad Ismail al-Muhaddith, also known as Shah Ismail Shaheed rahimahullah ta'ala. This individual, normally we talk about someone's life and then at the end we give a summary and we talk about what other people have said about this or that person. I wanted to begin by just to share what some people have said about this individual. So just to put things in perspective before we get into his remarkable life, rahimahullah ta'ala. One of the scholars, um, Shabir Ahmed Uthmani, he said about him, al-allama al-jaleel, al-arif, al-nabil. And he said about him, he was a great scholar, the distinguished scholar, the allama. And he said he was a person with no uh, comparison in his lifetime and no equal among his contemporaries. So he was a person, among his time, he was unequaled. Uh, other scholars, Siddiq Hassan Khan, for instance, he said about him that he was a man who really inherited the legacy of another great individual, Shah Waliullah al-Dahlawi. And he's the one who really took the work of Shah Waliullah forward. And he inherited his legacy, and he's the one who continued his work. So he's the one who solitarily is, is distinguished for being the, the real heir according to Sadiq Hassan Khan. Uh, we all heard of Muhammad Iqbal, the great poet, the philosopher, Allama Iqbal of Pakistan. He said about him that India has so far produced one really great scholar, and his name is Muhammad Ismail. So this is what Allama Iqbal said about this particular scholar. And one of my teachers, Sheikh Muhammad Akram Nadui, uh, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, I remember him saying to us that in India, in the history of India, there are two scholars in his particular mind who are really distinguished, that really take the cake, that are above the league from everyone else. And among them is Shah Ismail, and the second person, according to Sheikh Akram Nadwi, is uh, the great scholar Maulana Rashid Ahmad Gangohi, rahimahullah ta'ala. So this was Shah Ismail, someone that really shaped our life and someone whose imprint is felt in the world today, especially in the Indian subcontinent. So who was this remarkable individual? and What was the life he lived? Really, his life can fill volumes. But we're going to summarize some aspects of his legacy and his life. And there are many profound lessons that we can learn from the life of this remarkable person. He was born in the year 1193 of the Hijri calendar, which corresponds to 1779. 1779. So this is the late 18th century. So this is the late 18th century. And his father was Shah Abdul Ghani. And he was a son of Shah Waliullah. So what does that make Shah Ismail? He was the grandson of Shah Waliullah, rahimahullah ta'ala. To know the life of Shah Ismail, you need to know two individuals. You can't know who Shah Ismail was without knowing two other individuals. So the first individual is his paternal grandfather, the father of his father who was Shah Waliullah, the great scholar, the mujaddid of his time, a man who left his mark on the Muslim world in a way that rarely no one else has. 
He was someone who was universally acknowledged. Now we're talking about Shah Waliullah. He was universally acknowledged as being the mujaddid of his time. And today, so many groups and so many scholars trace their inspiration, their legacy from Waliullah al Dahlawi. And in fact, in the science of hadith, most of the chains of hadith that exist today, the isnad of all the hadith, or the majority of them that exist today, go back through Shah Waliullah directly. Because he was the one who revived the knowledge of hadith and revived the tradition of narrating hadith. And he was a great reformer, a great mujaddid, who left a, a huge legacy in India uh, and in that entire region. So Shah Waliullah, he had four sons. And to understand his life, you know, he, his, his, his school where he taught at, Madrasa Rahimiya, was a school that was founded by his father, Shah Abdul Rahim. And his father was living in the time of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. And in fact, his father, the father of Shah Waliullah, collaborated with Aurangzeb in the famous compilation of Fatwa, Fatawa Alamgiri, which was a fatwa commissioned by the Mughal Empire, a collection of fatwa of, uh, corresponding to the Hanafi school of thought. So it's a great book that uh, tremendous value, but the father of Shah Waliullah was involved in that. So Shah Waliullah was someone who went to the Hijaz and he traveled the Muslim world and he came back with a vision of reform. And he wrote tremendous works. Some of the works are taught in universities around the world today, including Azhar University. So he had four sons. After his father passed away, Shah Waliullah became the rector of his madrasa. And after him, he had four sons that he passed his legacy on. Now Shah Waliullah didn't have a lot of direct students because he was involved in reform. But he passed his tradition, his legacy of learning to, through his sons. So his primary son who took his place after he passed away, Shah Abdul Aziz. But he had four sons, Abdul Aziz, who inherited his position in the school, Shah Rafi Din, Shah Abdul Ghani, and Shah Abdul Qadir. Now Shah Abdul Qadir was the, the, the father of, or Shah Abdul Ghani was the father of Shah Ismail. So Shah Ismail was born into the scholarly household. So you can imagine Shah Waliullah, his, his sons are continuing that tradition. And now the grandson is born and you have this environment of knowledge and learning. So Shah Ismail, he learned primarily from his father, the son of Shah Waliullah Abdul Ghani. And his father passed away when he was very, very young. In fact, he was 10 years old when his father passed away. After his father passed away, the, the responsibility for his training and education fell to his uncles, the other sons of Shah Waliullah. So he learned from his father, and after his death, he learned from all three sons, all other three sons of Shah Waliullah. So in that way, he inherited the entire legacy of the Waliullah family. He memorized the Quran by the age of eight. And by the age of 15, it was said that he mastered all of the texts and all the science of hadith and the books of hadith. So he was a special student. It was noted about him that he was very smart and very intelligent. As a young child, it is noted that when he went to his uncle, for instance, Abdul Qadir, you know, they had lessons planned for the day. And every day, Shah Ismail would come to the lessons and he'd be reading four or five chapters ahead. And his uncle, his teacher, would get irritated and ask him, why are you going ahead? This is our lesson for today. And he would say, that's too easy for me. And then he would be tested on the material, you know, that passed. And he would know all the material. So he was a man who wasn't content with the syllabi and the curriculum and, and he would go, always go ahead. It is narrated that he knew the books inside out. So he became famous even when he was a student. People would come and just test him. He was like a prodigy. So people would come and test him while he was walking, for instance, ask him about certain things. And it said that he would answer as if he was reading from the book. That's the kind of memory that he had. Uh, one of the students or one of the scholars that said about him that he had memorized and he had at the tip of his tongue 30,000 hadith of the Prophet والسلام, So this was you know, an, a glimpse into the training of Shah Ismail Shaheed. So he was someone who inherited the, the legacy of this family and he was a great student. And he achieved, you know, he, he, he got what he could from all of his uncles and he learned everything there was to learn from that particular family. So when he was done with his studies and now he's 15 or 16 years old, most of his family members, they would go to a masjid and become an imam or a mufti and start teaching people, start giving fatawa. Shah Ismail was of a different character. He, was, he could not be bound down. 
Just like the lessons could not be, uh, he could not be constrained by the lessons, he couldn't imagine himself sitting in one place in one masjid and just teaching books. So he was like an adventurous spirit. So he really wanted to get involved and he wanted, so he traveled the, the world at that time, India. He traveled the land looking for purpose. He traveled the land looking for something to do. He didn't want to be a teacher. That was too mundane for him. So he always had this sense of mission, this sense of reform. That's why it is said that he's the true heir of Shah Waliullah, because he had that sense of mission, that sense of looking at the whole world and trying to make a difference and make an impact. So he met a person along the way, and this changed his life forever and defined his life for, until his death for the, the rest of his life. And that second person is, is the other person you need to know in order to understand Shah Ismail. The first one is his grandfather, Shah Waliullah. The second person he met in the year 1819, now this is the early 19th century, he met Sayyid Ahmad, Shaheed of Bareilly, a great reformer. Sayyid Ahmad was a, he was part of a military garrison of a particular Muslim leader, but eventually he broke from that and he raised the banner of reform, so he was a reformer. So he raised the banner of reform and he started a movement. So this is one of the first movements started in, in, in Indian history in, in the form of contempt, you know, kind of comparis, uh, comparable to modern organizations or movements. So Sayyid Ahmad, he was a reformer. He wanted to purify Indian society and establish Islam. So he raised the banner of reform and he gathered a movement. He had people signing up and pledging allegiance to him. When Shah Ismail heard about that and then he met that person, he immediately joined him. And immediately he was moved by his example and he trusted him and he uh, agreed with his mission. So he pledged allegiance to Sayyid Ahmad Shaheed. And at that time, you know, he was seven years younger than him. So Sayyid Ahmad, seven years younger than Shah Ismail. And Shah Ismail is a great scholar. His knowledge, uh, without any exaggeration, is much more than Sayyid Ahmad. But Sayyid Ahmad was the leader. So he pledged allegiance to him and he resolved to work with him. So he joined hands with Sayyid Ahmad and he became his scholarly right hand. And the two of them, they traveled across India and they transformed the continent, basically. They would go to different villages. They would find masajid that were empty. Nobody praying in the masajid or just praying some of the prayers. They would go to village after village, spend some time in the villages, establish salah in the masjid, invite people, go out in the streets, talk to people. They revived the institution of Salah and opened up Masajid in many, many cities throughout India. They, whenever they saw in, uh, institutions or, or practices uh, that were based in shirk or Indian culture and so on and so that were uh, against Islamic principles, they would raise their voice, they would educate people, they would reform people. So they raised the banner of reform, they revived Islam in many, many cities. And Shah Ismail, for instance, in, in, in Delhi, um, in the great masjid of, Jal, uh, of Delhi, the Jamia masjid or Shahi masjid at that time, he began to preach on Tuesdays and Fridays. So two days a week he selected to give khutbahs and to give lectures and to train people. And it is said that so many people started coming to his lectures because he became so famous in his lifetime that the nights of Tuesday and the nights of Friday, people started saying it was like Eid prayer. That's how many people started coming out. So this is the impact that Shah Ismail had all throughout the, the continent. They were traveling city after city, you know, reforming people, teaching them about the basic. And their theme, the themes of their da'wah and their mission was tawheed, of purifying the society from shirk and practices that were against Islamic principles, and to establish the obligations of Islam. So at this time, you know, there was a lot of ignorance. This is, you know, the pre-modern era. Um, a lot of people were unaware of the basic obligations of prayer and fasting and so on and so forth. So they really took India by storm and they had a huge impact. Just to give one example of what they did. Now this was a movement, an organized movement. It wasn't just people preaching and just, you know, it was they, they actually took steps to, to institute change. So one of the things they, they tackled was the institution of Hajj. So as I mentioned, their focus was the primary obligation, the basics of Islam, the fundamentals of Islam, which were you know, being neglected. So Hajj at this time was a very difficult journey. So in general, among the people and the culture was that Hajj was no longer an obligation. So rarely people made the Hajj. 
And in fact, there were fatwas and scholars who would say, because of the difficulties of the journey, because it was so hard to make it there, and many people didn't make it back, they said it's no longer an obligation to make hajj. So people considered it as something extra. So someone who made hajj was somebody who was very pious and great. It wasn't something that was you know, popular for the average person to do. So Shah Ismail and Sayyid Ahmad, they raised their voices. And they taught people, this is one of the pillars of Islam. No one has the right to lift this pillar out of you know, difficulty and so on and so forth. So they raised their voices, they educated people. And then, you know, one of the examples of what they did, they didn't just tell people about it or educate people. They publicly announced that they're going to take a whole delegation to Hajj. So they, they, they announced it, they raised awareness, and they announced to people, anyone who doesn't have the means that they were going to pay for it. So they raised the funds and they gathered up to a thousand people. So a thousand, they took a thousand people onto Hajj. They rented 10 ships and they took this entire caravan, a thousand people, that's like a mini city. And they took these people to Hajj and they came back about eight months later. And they revived this pilgrimage, this, this institution. And after that, it became, started becoming popular to make the Hajj. And people started making it more and more. So this is just an example of how they did things. And you know, those 10 ships, they made emirs for every ship. They were very highly organized. So they rented 10 ships. Every ship had an emir. One of the ships, Shah Ismail, was made the emir. And he took his family member, he took his mother, he took his sister, he took many individuals to perform the pilgrimage. So this is just you know, some glimpses into the life of Shah Ismail. Just some words about his piety. We talked about his scholarship. We talked about his spirit of reform. About his personal piety. He was someone who was very pious. Everyone who met him fell in love with him. And it is said, you know, there are a few instances that are um, prominent. I'll share with you just a couple. There was an individual or an official from the British, uh, from the East India Company. Now the backdrop at that time, you have to understand, this is the late 18th and early 19th century. What was the era? This was the end of the Mughal Empire. So the Mughals were still in charge and they were nominally in charge. So it was the last remnants of the Mughal Empire. And they were basically collapsing. And there were all these independent kingdoms all throughout India. Different sultanates and emirs here and there and even Sikh kingdoms and Hindu kingdoms. And then you had the British. The East India Company was there and they were trying to slowly take over. You know, they really took over in 1857 when the British really, you know, the era of the British Raj. But this was, the British were trying to control matters. There were the Sikhs, there were the Hindus, and the Mughal Empire was basically collapsing. So this was a, a difficult period, a period of declining Muslim power. So in this time, you know, one of the officials of the in, uh, East India Tea Company, he came to visit Shah Ismail. First time official business, maybe to ask him some questions or just to see, you know, where he's at. So he came to this, you know, he was directed to a place, he came to the masjid and he said, where is Shah Ismail? I'm here to see him. So someone pointed to a man and he looked at the person, the person had normal clothes and there were some of the parts were ripped and they weren't very clean. Now, this is a British official. Now, something about the British is that, you know, the British are very different from the Americans. One of the things is they're very much into decorum and etiquette uh, and so on and so forth, even to this day. You know, I was in England a few weeks ago and it was remarkable the, tie, the differences between America and Britain. Uh, for instance, in, we were in Pizza Hut. You know in, in, in England they eat pizza with spoons and forks. Nobody touches food with their hands because it's considered against etiquette. So even in places like Pizza Hut, everyone's eating with a fork and a, and a knife and, and even french fries. When you get french fries, they give you these little toothpicks that you, you pick up the fries with the toothpicks or these little devices. You're not supposed to touch food yourself. So this is, you know, the British are really much into decorum and proper etiquette and ranks and hierarchy. So an official came to see him and he became irritated. He was like, you know, stop playing games. I'm here to see Shah Ismail, who is a nephew of Shah Abdul Aziz. And they said a couple of times, this is really him. And then when he really it finally settled that this, per this is him and he looked at this humble person this great person whose personality was famous in his lifetime that officials are coming to see him, he began to cry. He was moved. So Shah Ismail, this was his personal example. Another person said he visited him uh, in the masjid and he said it was, uh, he led people in Qiyamul Layl, two rakars of prayer. And this person said that he led the prayer two rakars and he recited uh, Surah 
Bani Israel, Surah Al Isra, a lengthy surah, and he finished the entire surah in two rakahs. And this man said that he never heard Quran so beautiful in his life before that time or after that time. So he was so moved by that, just the way he led prayers and his piety and how softly he, he, he recited the Quran and how moving you know, that whole experience was. So there are many, many examples of people who are moved by his spiritual <clears throat> example and his personal example and his piety. It is said often he would be walking uh, with his horse and his servants or the people, his companions would be riding the horse and he's on the floor with the saddle, with the reins and walking in front. So he would be doing things, he was a people scholar. He mixed with the people, he lived with the people. He never you know, liked stages, he never liked being you know, in these, these categories or being apart from the people. Um, and towards the end of their life, what happened was, <clears throat> now the Muslims were, their situation was becoming more and more perilous. So now the Mughals were declining and you know, Muslim kingdoms were being wiped out being taken over mostly by the Sikhs in Punjab and also by the British and, and other kingdoms. So these were Muslim cities that were being taken over by non-Muslims. <clears throat> and here Muslims were ruling for hundreds of years, centuries. So the cities were being taken over and then the Adhan was being banned. People were prevented from coming to the Masajid. So it was a huge disaster. So Sayyid Ahmad Shahid, this movement, what they did, they decided to take up the banner of Jihad. Now that's slightly controversial in our times, but you have to understand this is the colonial era. This is the era where people were being slaughtered, where the colonial powers were taking over Muslim lands, carving up kingdoms. So Sayyid Ahmad Shahid, he decided that we need to fight back. So he raised the banner of jihad, and he raised this banner of rebellion. It was a freedom war. And many people joined his ranks and they started fighting back. And Shah Ismail was side by side with him. So they went to Muslim city after city and they liberated city after city. And they restored it to Muslim rule. And everywhere they went, they instituted uh, Islamic principles and Islamic society. And they were hugely successful. In one particular campaign, it's uh, described that they traveled for days. They covered about 3,000 miles over a couple of weeks. Just going from city to city where people were needed, where Muslims were in trouble, they would be there. So they weren't just scholars, they weren't just reforming people. If, if there was a need, they were there. So this was a powerful, powerful movement. And it took the whole continent by storm. And towards the end of their life, a tragedy happened that, you know, they, uh, they conquered Peshawar, for instance, and they established Islamic rule in Peshawar, the city of Peshawar. So now we're in the northwest frontier area. And eventually they started having opposition. Some of the, this is a tribal area, some of the tribes turned against them. Then they were forced to shift to the Kashmir region. So they went to a town called Balakot. And this is a town where they established themselves. And at this time, the, the, the war intensified. So you had British forces. And the people who were really attacking them were the Sikh armies. So there was an army of, of a Sikh garrison army. Um, and it was led by Sher Singh. And they surrounded Balakot. And this army, this entire movement, they were in the city of Balakot. And eventually what happened, based on some treachery of some Muslim tribe that turned against them, uh, eventually, you know, there were the Sikhs attacked, they found their positions, and they had a battle that lasted a few days. And in that particular tragedy, that battle, all of the followers of, of Sayyid Ahmad and Shah Ismail lost their lives. And Sayyid Ahmad lost his life, he was martyred. Shah Ismail lost his life and was martyred, and very few people survived from that movement. And to this day, the bodies of these individuals are buried in that town. I had the opportunity of visiting the region in 97. It's a mountainous area, and you go to that village today, it's a humble village. It's in the middle of hills and mountains, and it's a small, humble graveyard where the, the graves of Shah Ismail and Sayyid Ahmad Shaheed are found to this day. There's no mausoleum, there's no huge structure, simple graves but they were buried in that time and the movement came to an end. So this is a glimpse into the life of Shah Ismail, someone who had such tremendous impact in the subcontinent. Now there's one part I didn't mention is his scholarly activities. He wrote a number of books. He wrote a number of, now you can imagine someone who's involved in, in fighting the colonial powers, someone who's involved in traveling so much, involved in reforming matters, would that person have time to write books? 
But Shah Ismail, he wrote a number of books, number of works. And just mentioning one of them, a book that we all need to know is a book that he wrote called Taqwiyatul Iman. Taqwiyatul Iman was a book he wrote in his lifetime that became very famous in his own lifetime. Now this is the early 19th century um, and this is the time where the printing press was becoming popular. The printing press was around for some time but this is the time where uh, industrial printing became common. So now books were being published in mass quantities. So they took advantage of that and they published Taqwiyatul Imam, Iman and other books and they distributed them on a mass scale. So this book became very, very famous in his lifetime. People would read it. It was written in Urdu and in Persian, but mostly it was published in Urdu. And it was read by cities all across India. And in fact, there were many opponents as well, people who opposed this book. And because when you start a reform movement and you want to purify society from un-Islamic practices, there are going to be opposition. There's going to be opposition. There are going to be people who are unhappy people who want the status quo, people who don't want things to change. So this book became very popular in his lifetime, it was written in plain Urdu language, and Urdu was a new language at that time, so it contributed to the genre of Urdu prose. And many, many people were transformed by this book. Many people read this book and, and they changed their lives and they, they endeavored to meet Sayyid Ahmad and Shah Ismail. So it had a huge impact. And it's estimated by some sources, we don't know how accurate it is, it's probably been printed from that time to our time uh, probably about four million times. So four million printings of this book. So this is a hugely popular work. It's one of the most popular books in the Urdu language. Things may have changed now, but for in the, we're talking about 19th century to early 20th century. So it was a book that had a tremendous impact. Just to mention one person who read the book was a, an individual who was a Sikh. He wasn't Muslim, he was Sikh. And he was interested in Islam and one of the books someone gave him was Taqwiyatul Iman. He read that book and after that book he embraced Islam. And after he embraced Islam, he, be, uh, he started studying Islam. And he entered the famous seminary Darul Uloom in Deoban. And he became a great scholar. And he became someone who's known in history today as a great scholar. His name was Maulana Ubaidullah Salim, uh, a Sindhi. Maulana Ubaidullah Sindhi. So he was a Sikh who read the book Taqwiyatul Iman. And you know, this is, he was a child when he read the book and this is after the lifetime of Shah Ismail. He embraced Islam based upon this book, just one example. And he became a great scholar. He was a student of Hussein Ahmad Madani. And he traveled the world. In World War I, he had a huge impact. He was part of the, free, the freedom movement of India. And he traveled to Russia and all around the world, raising the cause of the Muslims in India. So just an example of the impact of some of these individuals um, and I'll end with some lessons from his life, just share five brief points. Number one, the importance of training our families. You know, Shah Ismail, he's a product of several generations of family effort. From the father of Shah Waliullah to Shah Waliullah to his four sons to the grandson. This was a family that trained their children in Islam, that passed on their tradition. We mentioned this in the previous session as well. So it's a product of this, this devotion, this tarbiyah of the family that Shah Ismail was born out of. So this is something very important. We need to you know, pass on the tradition. We need to focus on our children. We need to teach them our religion, our deen. And we don't know. They're, they're going to be better than us. That should be our hope and our aspiration. Perhaps after our lifetime from our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, there will be people who will have a tremendous impact. So that's the first lesson from the life of Shah Ismail. The second lesson is the link between knowledge and activism. You know, in our times, there's a huge divide. You know, we think that knowledge, it has to do with academic knowledge, how many books you memorize, how many things, uh, you know, how much academic knowledge you have. And a scholar is supposed to be someone who's sitting in a masjid, just teaching people, memorizing texts, and just passing fatwa after fatwa. And then we look down on activists, those who are involved in reforming society, those who are going door to door in various efforts going out of their homes and those people, there's, a, there's a chasm between scholars and activists today, unfortunately. Shah Ismail was an individual who bridged that, that divide. He was a scholar of the highest rank as we saw from his, his lineage and his scholarly contribution. But yet he was the ultimate activist. He joined a movement and he joined somebody who's younger than him and less knowledgeable than him. 
But he contributed in these ways. He was carrying things. He was going to villages, helping out people, you know, tending to the needs of the community. So, you know, this bridge between scholarship and activism is an artificial divide. It's not a real divide. The real scholars are those who are involved in society. So this is something we should learn from his life that, you know, there's no such thing as spirituality and socialism, social affairs and so on and so forth. Some people have this misconception that khutbahs are supposed to be, you know, about spirituality and connecting with Allah. It's not about, it's supposed to be about Muslim affairs or what's happening in the world today. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The real scholars were those who were involved in society. They gave their lives. Shah Ismail gave his blood and he was, he was killed. He was martyred. He was shaheed. May Allah accept his sacrifice. Because of you know, his, 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 his desire to change the affairs of the Muslim world. So we should have a healthy respect for those who are activists and those who are inclined towards academic knowledge. We need both for our ummah. You can't have one without the other. And we need more people involved in both. So people who are involved in activism should also be involved in learning Islam and not neglect that part of our life. And those who are memorizing texts and learning Islam, memorizing Quran, should also be active in political and social affairs of the Muslims. So this is a lesson from his life, number two. Number three, Shah Ismail had the spirit of reform. Sometimes we, all we're concerned about is particular masail. Particular things, you know, what do, how do I pray, and you know, how many rakahs is tarawih, and things like that. And our entire life is consumed by those things. But we forget the bigger picture. The bigger picture is what's happening with the Muslim world. You know, our situation today is more dire than it was perhaps. An argument can be made in that respect. But Shah Ismail was a great scholar. He could have sat down in a masjid and just taught people hadith, and taught people text. But he saw the affair, the Mughal Empire was declining. This was a huge tragedy in the Muslim world. You have a thousand years of Muslim rule and finally it's coming to an end and non-Muslims taking over. You know, our, our whole heritage was in danger of being destroyed. So Shah Ismail always had that bigger picture in mind. He had the spirit of reform and he didn't just preach and teach but he wanted to make an impact and a difference. And he did it in a very creative way. So we, need, we all need to think about the ummah. When's the last time we thought about the Muslim ummah? It's not popular anymore to think about the Muslim Ummah, to make dua for the Ummah, to make dua for Muslims in this part of the world or that part of the world. And it's harder and harder doing that living in this country because of the, the situation we find ourselves. But you know, we're part of a global you know, Ummah. We should be concerned about every human being and also about the Ummah. So this is something that should always be at the forefront of our minds. Number four, the importance of discipline and organization. This is a huge problem for in our times. Today, Muslims believe in chaos, unfortunately. In terms of religious affairs, in terms of da'wah, our model is anarchy and chaos. Every imam wants to be independent, wants to be the mufti, the khalifa, the shaykh al-islam, and issuing everything. And every scholar, every person, everywhere he is, just wants to do things his own way. But where's that spirit of unity? Where's that discipline? Where's that organization? You know, this is the, the, the spirit of unity is very important. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, what did he say about the salah? In salah, we have an imam. That's a lesson for us. In salah, we're not supposed to pray alone. We're supposed to pray with one imam. We follow every movement of that imam. And everyone's united and ranks behind him. That's a symbol for us. That's a lesson for us how to live our lives. So the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, even if you're traveling three people, what did he say? Appoint an emir among you. If you're praying, there's one imam, one amir. If you're traveling, just going from one place to another, appoint an amir among you. When he sent armies or delegations, he always appointed one amir. But yet somehow we think to do Islamic work, to teach people, to do da'wah, we don't need amirs, we don't need discipline, we don't need organization. Nothing could be farther from the truth. So we need to revive that spirit of Shah Ismail that although he was such a great scholar, he could have called you know, people to himself. But yet he joined a movement, someone who was junior to him, and he became part of this struggle and this, and he contributed in a greater way because of that. So we need to be thinking toward in that line, in everything that we do, all our projects, we should work with each other, work with others. And there should be discipline and organization, and we should do things in an organized way. That's why the Prophet, uh, Allah, Yadu Allahi ala al as the Prophet said, the hand of Allah is over the jama'ah, the protection of Allah, 
is over those who organize themselves and, or, and operate in an organized way. Finally, the last thing, the last lesson is the importance of Muslim unity versus dividing ourselves in factionalism. You know, the time of Shah Ismail was a very difficult time. It was a dark time in some respects and it was a bright time in some respects. There was a lot of opposition in his own lifetime. Unfortunately, that's the reality. There's, every scholar is afflicted by people who are jealous of him. That's always happened in our history. You know, human beings are human beings. So whenever someone becomes famous or popular, there will be others that start you know, talking against that person. Someone raises the banner of reform, there will be people say, no, this person is, is this or that. So in Shah Ismail's time, he had tremendous opposition. He had a tremendous impact and a huge response. But yet, at the same time, there were many people opposed to him. There were many people who read his book and they wrote against that book. So there are certain individuals that are very active and vocal, raising voices and calling him various names. And there were people who pronounced takfir on him. They said he was kafir. He wasn't Muslim. He was kafir because of certain views that he had. Because of this, he was accused of being Gustafi Nabi. Someone who hated the Prophet or disrespected the Prophet. And these terms, you find them today, they're still in circulation against many scholars. So this is nothing new. It's been happening for hundreds of years. So among the terms, and it's very interesting that one of the most popular terms people used against him is the W word. What's the W word? It's still used today, yes. Wahhabi. One of the biggest charges against him that he was Wahhabi. And he never met the person. And when he went to Hajj, the Wahhabis weren't in control of, of, of Makkah and Medina. It was another group. They were still you know, in the outskirts. So there's no direct evidence that they were, you know, they, you know, there was any contact or link between them. Yet, that was the dirty word. That was always the dirty word. It's been the dirty word for the past few centuries. So he was accused of being that. And you know, there are examples of many letters written by prominent people writing letters to officials of different cities, asking them to ban these people because they're Wahhabis, they're this and that. You know, if they, the terrorism that as a term was popular at that time, they would have used it. But that's a new term that was invented now. But had it been there, they would have been used against them. So there are two individuals in particular that are very vocal against uh, Shah Ismail and his reforms. And to this day, people who are against that, they're always quoting those two individuals. I won't say their names. But um, they weren't really great scholars by any merit, but they basically wrote against Shah Ismail. And everywhere Shah Ismail went, they followed. Him. And they warned the people, don't listen to this person, this person is this and that. And they even had, you know, forced them out of many towns. And in the end, it was treachery that made them lose their lives. You know, they were in Balakot, and it was Muslims that turned against them. So that's the last lesson I wanted to share that when we focus on our differences, when we focus on these divisions and factionalism and sectarianism, then we fall. And all of our tragedies, many of our greatest tragedies are linked to that. That it's our own, we're our own worst enemies. So we as Muslims, we need to think of the ummah. We need to respect all of our Muslims, all of our scholars, people we have differences of views with. Alhamdulillah, they're still part of the Muslim ummah. They're still our brothers and sisters and they have rights. So we need to look in that spirit rather than focusing on these issues. And the issues at that time were really comical. You know, when you look at, you know, the huge debates being raised at that time, when you think about them today, it's really, it makes you laugh. But these were the debates that they were accused of being kafir over. And these were the debates hundreds of pages were written about. Among them, one of the debates was that can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does He have the power to create some, another Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Does he have the power to create another Jibreel and another prophet? So, you know, you know there's some things in the writings of, of Shah Ismail that said Allah has ultimate power. He has the power to do anything that he could tell you. There's a beautiful passage where he said, you know, the power of Allah is such that even with one command, he could create a thousand universes like ours, with a thousand angels like ours, and a thousand prophets like ours, including our prophet. So it's just a statement. But then people read, you know what? He's, he's denying the uniqueness of the Prophet Muhammad. He's Gustaf and Nabi, and this is Kufr. And so, this is one of the debates. So, one of the debates was the seven heavens, Sabah Samawat. And in one of the ideas at that time where every heaven had an alternate dimension, another world just like ours human beings, and jinn, and other people, and prophets like ours. So, the debate was is there a Prophet Muhammad in each of these heavens? And if there is, you know, there, this, these were the raging debates. 
Really, so, you know, this is what consumed the minds of some people. But not Shah Ismail and Sayyidah, they were looking at the bigger picture. So that's the last lesson, that we need to be ummah-centric, we need to focus on the things that unite us. If Allah says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Allah says about the kuffar, the kuffar. Allah says in the Qur'an, say to the kuffar, أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ Come to something that's common between us. So we're supposed to invite the, you know, other non-Muslims and sit down with them on things that we can agree upon. What about the Muslims? What about the Muslims that we have differences? We can't come together on common elements if we believe in the Qur'an and the Prophet and you know, La ilaha illallah. We can't unite on that. If we can unite even on things, we can unite on the things we agree with Christians who worship Jesus. But we can't unite with the Muslims on common ground. So that's the last lesson from the life of this great Imam, Shah Ismail Shaheed rahimahullah ta'ala, who although he died at a relatively young age and he was martyred, and that battle was a tragedy in some respects, but the sacrifice that he gave, his life, his works are still alive today. And today we're still talking about him, rahimahullah ta'ala. That's a testimony to his sincerity and his sacrifice and that he was on the right track. We should all make dua for all the scholars that came before us who sacrificed, who gave their blood so that we may learn, that we may continue this tradition, we may know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala khayri khalqihi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. With that, I know there's going to be a lot of comments. I'm sure there are people here that know more about this topic than I do. I'm not, I don't really read Urdu. It's, uh, but there are people I'm sure who's read the books more than I have and so feel free to share your comments uh, and as well. Does yeah. he have any descendants? Um, he had a son uh, from the sources all I found was that he had one son uh, so he died at a relatively young age uh, he married one time and he had one son <clears throat> but from the sources it seems like that son after his father passed away he was very despondent and he just traveled um, you know the cities as if he was lost so there's, there's really no, like, um, there's no trace of any like, scholarly um, isnad or, or legacy uh, traced to him directly. Although there are people who studied with him. So among the people that studied with him, and I have some handouts here just for your interest. Um, this is based on some research uh, over a few years. This is the legacy of Shah Waliullah. So I included on one page the isnad of Shah Waliullah through various students to our times today. So you can see many of our, our movements today, many of the scholars today, all go through the chain of Shah Waliullah. So there's something very interesting. So Shah Ismail, among his students, was Nadir Hussain al Dahlawi. Um, so he took Sanad from him in books of Hadith. And today in the Hijaz, in Makkah and Medina, the scholars today, most of them who have Ijaz and Hadith, goes through Nadir Hussain al Dahlawi from Shah Ismail through Shah Waliullah, Rahimahullah ta'ala. So his, his sanad is still alive today, but because he didn't spend so much time teaching, it's not as popular as, as the other chains. Shah Abdul Aziz was the main son of Shah Waliullah. Most of the chains go through him and his student, Shah Muhammad Ishaq. Wallahu a'lam. Okay, so the, the brother asked about, is Shah Ismail regarded as a mujaddid? The proper term is mujaddid. So there's a tradition in, in our religion of something called tajdid. Tajdid comes from the word jaddada, which means to make something new, to revive something. So it basically comes from a hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, Inna Allah yab'athu ala uh, uh, ra'si kulli mi'ati sanatin may yujaddid <clears throat> so the Prophet said Allah will raise up at the head of every hundred years of my ummah someone who will revive the deen for them. So tajdeed is, is a concept um, and I think it's, 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 um, a lot of people took this literally and they said that every hundred years there's going to be one person, one man. 
or one individual that's going to be the mujaddid who restores the glory to the ummah, who revives the sunnah and revives Islam. But if you look at it that way, there is no list you'll find in the world that agrees. You know, generally people agree on a lot of things. So most people agree that the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, and, and um, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Imam al-Shafi were mujaddids of their time. But those are four people, they lived in the same era. So it's not one person. And in our history, no one has ever been able to come up with a neat formula that every hundred years there's one person. People have tried, but there's always, it comes up with, you know, four in this century, or this century really has no one. So really the correct understanding of this hadith is that tajdeed, the process of tajdeed is a general process. It's a responsibility for everyone to revive Islam to some way, to revive a sunnah. You know, the Prophet man ahya sunnati, whoever revives one of my sunnah, sunnah that has been neglected. And this is speaking to individuals. So it's the same concept. Then everyone who follows that sunnah, he gets the reward of everyone that are doing that. So this is a general concept. We're all supposed to be involved in reform, in tajdeed. So reform in, in English is a slightly problematic term because reform has other connotations. It means like bringing new things. But in Islam, tajdeed is to reform Islam to its original spirit, to bring it back to its sources. So Shah Ismail, without a doubt, was a mujaddid. But was he the mujaddid of his century? I've never read that. Perhaps someone has read that anybody claimed that he was the mujaddid of that century. Because um, at that time, there were many individuals that, that could claim that title. So Shah Waliullah generally is undisputed. He was a mujaddid of his time. But you know, Shah Ismail was definitely a mujaddid. But if you follow this literal formula, perhaps not. Wallahu a'lam. Anyone has insights? I mean, uh, I'm sure the people who read Urdu have, would have more insights uh, into uh, what is said about Shah Ismail Shaheed. And if there's any sisters who have questions, um, either you can uh, write them down or feel free to ask them directly. Just uh, there's an area here in front of the elevator. Feel free to come out and ask. Okay, so I'll leave uh, some of these uh, handouts here. I only have 20 copies, so I don't have a lot, but I should be placing them on our, um, perhaps on some website, inshallah, soon. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaha.